People often wonder about the future of wearables because it seems as if wearables were a little bit fashionable maybe a decade ago and now they seem to have hit a bottleneck. So what's the matter? What's happening? What's the future of wearables? I was involved very early on in the creation of the wearable space with the invention of something that we called the quantified self. And the idea was that we would use technology to measure ourselves, technologies that we could wear in some capacity, and that we would monitor ourselves in order to know ourselves better, to improve our health, to improve our productivity. And so we spent a lot of time in a whole decade experimenting with different kinds of wearables. Um, from things that you wear on your wrist very simply, like the early Fitbits, to more complicated devices around your wrist, like a Apple Watch. But there were also things that you could wear on your clothes that would detect things like your heartbeat, your skin response, your posture. So these were wearables that you would wear as clothes or a vest. Um, and there are wearables that you can wear in your ears and wearables that you could wear as a hat that would pick up signals and measurements around your head, and even wearables as glasses. And of course, today there's a whole new category of wearables around the idea of augmented reality, see-through glasses, where you put them on and you can see the world, and it is in some ways augmenting your natural vision with either a virtual presence of things or with an overlay of information that can display the intangible world. And those glasses and wearables can also, of course, continue this project of trying to quantify ourselves, of trying to measure our own bodies. So there have been many challenges in the wearable space. Um, one of the minor challenges of wearables like glasses and clothing is the uncool factor, the factor that, that we care very much about how we look. And a lot of that is really not about pure aesthetics. It's much more about what's current or fashionable, what's accepted right now. Today, of course, people wearing glasses, the regular kind, it's no big deal, but they looked very, very funny and were unacceptable 200 years ago when it was considered very strange and weird and dorky. But we've come to accept that. So there are lots of styles and lots of things about wearables that are very fashion driven. So the early versions of the Google Glass wearable um, were rejected in part because it just didn't look cool to the people at the time. A hundred years from now, someone wearing those glasses, it may be considered very retro, very kind of fashionable. And that's because our ideas of what's acceptable changes over time. So there's always going to be a hurdle about how things look when we're talking about wearables, whether it's, whether it's acceptable to have something on your wrist or on your glasses or on your throat or on your ears. Those will change over time and some of that will come and go. So that's always going to be a bottleneck, always going to be a challenge for things that we wear. A second ongoing challenge for wearables has been batteries and charging. These are electronic devices and because we tend to want to wear them all day or wear them for a long period of time, having enough power to keep them charged and then having to recharge them is not a trivial issue. Particularly as we like to have them thin or small or in some ways streamlined, um, that goes against the very idea of having a long-lived battery. So, in some senses, we're still and always will be waiting for better ways to power these devices. There are many, many alternatives to just having a little battery. There's near field, char field charging where you could pick up a charge from something nearby. There are solar chargers. There are ways that can charge things based on motion of your body. There may be heat from your body. So. There are, are, are alternatives and we're kind of exploring those, but none of them have really reached the point where we can kind of keep these things going on a daily basis without a little bit of attention. 
And so that little bit of attention sometimes is enough to prevent the wide adoption. And that's currently a second challenge to wearables is keeping them powered in a timely manner. But neither of those, neither the fashion nor the, th the, the battery charging issues are really what has kept the wearable space from becoming larger. The, 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 the prime challenge has been that wearables generate a lot of data. That's sort of what they're there for. They're to generate data to, 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 or else to consume data. And this bandwidth has been a huge problem. One is just, re just being connected outside all the time at the correct bandwidth, and then two, processing the amount of data that is being generated, either on this device or in the cloud. So in a certain sense, the very thing that it's meant to do has been its stumbling block that's prevented it from proceeding further into the society. The quantified self, we can collect your heart rate, your glucose, your pulse, your temperature, maybe a hundred different parameters on an ongoing 24 hour basis. But the problem is, is what do we do with that information? It's, it's so much information that even a human like yourself can't process it. And we sort of need artificial intelligence to process this. That hasn't really been cheap and widely available yet, but it's just beginning. So in a certain sense, we, we're generating all this stuff, but we can't find meaning in it. We can't find anything actionable. We can get a lot of numbers and get a lot of data points, but that's not what we really want. We want to know what do we do about it? How does it change what we do? What should we do differently? Um, what should I know? And that problem about processing the results has been the major hurdle in making wearables more common because it's not worth wearing this stuff if it doesn't really give us any benefit. Even like the Fitbit has had a peak of adoption has gone down because, all right, it can tell you how many steps, but what else can it tell you? And so the kinds of things that we would like to know demand a level of processing with artificial intelligence that isn't available yet. It will be in the future, but it's not there yet, and so that makes them less useful to us over time. The same things with the kind of a shirt or other clothing that might tell us our posture or our health or our productivity. We don't want a lot of numbers. We don't want to have to pay attention to them. We don't want to deal with spreadsheets. We want it to say, hey, you know, here, you, you may notice this, that if you do this, sit up a little higher, you'll feel better, you'll be able to sit longer during the day. Oh, I don't mean that way, I mean like this over here. So that kind of information has not yet come technologically, but we're on that path to it. And so we probably have to wait another generation or two of technology before we'll have that availability of the processing power to crunch these numbers and give us the kind of information we want from those kinds of wearables. The other kind of wearable that I was talking about, the augmented reality, where you have a see-through glasses, that also can only work unless we have large-scale, cheap, ubiquitous artificial intelligence. Because again, it is seeing the world, it's mapping the world. In order to map the world, it has to have a smart AI behind it to be able to understand that world. And so um, we are quickly being able to make little tiny glasses and thin that can see the world and display a screen in front of our eyes. We still have the issues of whether it looks dorky, of whether the battery can last, but we can do that. But the processing power, being able to discern and understand what we're seeing, to be able to recognize that that's a chair over there, and then that's a doorway over there, and that's the stairs that we need to be careful over there. That kind of smartness does not exist yet. And when it does come, it'll have to be something that will be communicating from the cloud. It will require kind of a constant always on 
connection to the cloud because of that's a huge amount of bandwidth that has to be processed, locating where we are, knowing what room we're in and where we're facing. And so this also is compute cycles, it's, it's computational. And as fast as Moore's law is decreasing the cost of things, it's really not quite fast enough, given the idea of increasing amount of information and bytes that we need in order to make this work. So they're kind of fighting against each other. And for the moment, there isn't that much, or, or I should say that the progress has been slow because the challenges are so high in terms of the amount of data that are required to make this work. And so I think that if we look at the future of these wearable um, glasses, what we now call smart glasses, I think that's, this is a whole decade that's going to take for us to get a grip, grip on the amount of data to be able to have enough cheap AI available to process this for in, in, every person who's wearing these glasses. I think this is a 10-year, 15-year journey in order to reach that. It's not next year, not the year after. So I think for the next decade and a half, wearables are going to be slow in becoming common. I, I think, as I've said other places, I think that the path for these wearables with augmented reality is going to be primarily at work, partly because they're because it's expensive to provide the AI, but it's going to be worth it. There's an economic model. There's an economic incentive to increase the productivity of people working. So it's worth it to the worker and the company to finance this kind of a wearable. Um, and secondly, I think the kind of tasks that it, it will be good for in the beginning will be much more related to the focus tasks of of working in a warehouse, working manually, working with data, all the kinds of things where we can have a little bit narrower focus rather than the kind of open-ended work of just walking down the street and seeing things, which is much more difficult. And so for the next decade and a half, I think wearables will become very common at work, even though they may not be at home or a person walking outside. And that has several different Scenarios. One scenario is because it's fashionable at work, kind of like wearing your badge. People don't wear the badges outside. That's you know that's considered uncool to wear your company badge outside of work. It's just something you wear at work. Maybe the glasses take on that attribute where yeah you wear them at work, but you don't really wear them in public. You don't wear them at home or on the street. That's one scenario. The other scenario is that. Maybe they become cool at work in the way that cell phones kind of did. And then they kind of spread from there because everybody gets used to them using at work and then they start to bring them home. And um, they're so good that they migrate from work into the rest of life that way. That's the second scenario. I don't know which one will happen, but I'm pretty sure that we're going to first experience wearables mostly at work for a very long time, at least a decade and a half, before we'll see them commonly out on Main Street. So, in short, I think the future of wearables is um, that we're going to, they will continue to move very slowly. Maybe they won't be sexy or cool, or maybe they won't even have high valuations, but that there'll be a slow progress as we unleash artificial intelligence and the compute cycles that we need to actually make these things work over time. And I think the thing that comes after smartphones are smart glasses. That's the next big thing after the things that we hold in our hands and look at the little rectangular screen that we're not going to do that forever. We're going to put on smart glasses and wear them. I think they're going to have audio components. I've neglected to mention that a big part of this immersive experience is not just seeing things, but also hearing things. And um, we're directed by what we hear, and we'll have voice interactions where we speak to 
things. And so that interaction of speaking, hearing, listening, communicating with an AI personal assistant, all that can come through the same pair of wearables. So the wearables, I think, have to include some audio component that we plug into our ears or over our ears or our jaws or something. And so um, that vision of having these things come after the smartphones as being the next big thing, I think, is still on the table, is still happening. But I think it's going to take a little bit longer time to happen than we might want or even imagine just thinking about it. Because there's a, there's a, a saying in thinking about the future that we should not confuse being able to see what's next and confuse that with a short distance. So, so, so we might be able to very clearly see that smart glasses are coming, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be coming very soon, just like flying cars or something that we could imagine very early on, but it's taken a long time to get there. I think these wearables are the same thing. We can kind of very clearly see them working and how they would work and why they would be important. But I think it's going to take a long time to come, primarily because this requires high degree of intelligence, smartness that we don't quite have yet, but that we will have in the coming decades.